we will uh, review uh, abstract writing uh, first and then do some exercises. So, I would like to briefly uh, point out one thing that uh, uh, in all the exercises that we are doing in face to face, the concepts will only be very briefly reviewed. So, the idea of flipped classroom is that uh, participants that is your students in later if they take this flipped classroom mode, they are supposed to view the lectures online, take the exercises which you have already done and then come to the classroom. Now, I understand that you might have viewed all these lectures uh, long back about uh, more than a month back. So, uh, it is very likely that you might have forgotten those concepts. And uh, if we are to uh, review all the uh, lectures now, then we will not be doing uh, more of interaction. So, I request you if you uh, do not recollect the facts to please uh, view the lectures again. The lectures are still available uh, in IIT Bombay X and the schedule is also available. So, uh, looking at the schedule, you can uh, view the lectures online and then come to uh, this class uh, the next day. So, uh, because of time constraint, we cannot go through it completely, but definitely we will review important points from the uh, lectures. Okay. So, today uh, we will continue with um, abstract writing and today it is whole day it is about uh, summary writing. So, with different forms of summary we will see. So, firstly we are seeing summary for technical work which is called as abstract writing and then summary for an elevator pitch which is like a very short summary and then summary for uh, a general audience. Suppose, you want to tell your work to a very general audience like your uh, somebody at home, somebody who is not even uh, educated in science and so on. So, these are three different types of summary that we will be seeing today. So, very briefly there are different ways we can structure abstract. What I am going to discuss now is uh, the most generic way. It has been adopted from uh, the uh, guidelines followed in nature and we have just slightly modified it. So, the important thing to remember is the most generic description of an abstract is this hourglass shape. So, hourglass shape means there is a broad background okay which includes the introduction to the problem as well as the background to the specific problem and then actual problem that you are stating. Remember we said that technical communication the two important things are the question and the answer. What is the question that you are trying to solve? What is the research question you are trying to solve? And what is it that you have found out? Okay. So, that is the problem and then followed by the result. Okay, so, the background to the problem followed by the result and then once you have the result, so what? Okay, the answer is so what, how, what does it imply? That is the still broader implication. So, quickly it will be, so we will do an exercise when you will be able to identify all these things, we will do two exercises now. But let me just quickly see how it is located. So, first two lines of introduction which can be understood by anybody who is generally literate in science or engineering. Okay. So, that is a very broad statement, what is the broad area of work and so on. And then, so it is actually a very nice analogy, you can give this analogy to your students which they will be easily able to appreciate. The analogy is to think of a university. Now, the first statement that you say has to be understood by everybody in your university. The second statement is more specific and that has to be understood by people in your department. So, that is also the background part and then a couple of sentences, two or three sentences you can use and then come to the only one statement of the problem. Notice the problem and the answer, the result is just two statements, one statement each. And then once you have got the result, how does it imply to something in your department? Okay. So, you started with the university, come to the department, state the problem, state the result and then go back to the department. What does this result imply to the department? And then very broad, what does it imply to the society or the university at large? 
okay so this is the structure all right so i will take a couple of questions here very briefly so if you have questions please raise your hands after that we will do the tutorial where you will see examples of this and we will ask you to identify things so if you have questions please raise your hands uh, yes sir is it necessary to write index terms or uh, keywords in abstract the question is is it uh, necessary to use index terms and keywords in abstract the answer is yes it is very important because abstract is the only thing that is uh, freely available okay so when search engines are looking for uh, content only abstract is freely available the text is not generally available to all search engines okay so therefore it's important that you include the keywords in different forms i mean when you ex describe the problem and the uh, background problem and result you will definitely encounter or where you say methodology or whatever you will encounter places where you can mention the keywords so it's very important that you mention the keywords thank you yashwant rao chavan college sir uh, some journals or conferences demand that the number of words for abstract should not be more than 150 words uh, many a times it becomes impossible to describe the new ideas of our paper in 150 words in this case what should be done okay write your whole abstract in 30 words to begin with okay then you make it 60 words then you will not have a problem with 150 words see the problem is we always assume that we have to convey the entire thing in the abstract that is not so you need to convey only the essence of the whole work and the essence of the work is just in the question and the answer in the structure that i have given this is the essence the problem and the result is the essence now you start here you can finish this in 30 words somebody has asked you for 100 words maybe you include one line here and one line there somebody has asked you for 150 words maybe use one more line here so you have to think about the core the core is about 30 words you start here and then expand this way and this way you will be able to do it okay we will do this exercise today and you will see how you are able to do this we will see a different levels of uh, writing abstract so in one of them you will be able to write it in 30 words and then from there you can expand so the problem is if you think you want to put everything it is not possible i'll take one last question from geetanjali institute sir the difference between introduction of abstract and the introduction of a paper introduction is introduction to the problem okay whether it comes in abstract or whether it comes in the paper it is the same now introduction is a broad area the context where you are coming from so if you state it in one line you can if you can compress the whole paragraph in one line it you can put it in the abstract but both are the same okay thank you all right so uh, I'm going to reset the questions now. We are going to do some exercises. So I want you to uh, write down in a paper the following th three things, uh, what, whatever the structure that I described, introduction, background, problem, result, implication to the area and a broad societal implication. Okay. So please keep this structure in mind. Now what I will want you to do, this is an abstract from nature. Okay, the same guidelines that we saw. All right. So I want you to read each of the sentence and identify which sentence indicates what. Okay. So this is an exercise that we give our own students. So I am asking you to do it because it will help you to give the same exercise to your own students. So what you need to do is you just download any recent uh, nature article. You please go through it first and see that uh, you are able to. Uh, make out the uh, different parts of the abstract and then you give a printout to your students and ask them to underline which sentence is the introductory sentence, which sentence is the background, which is the problem, which is the result, implication and so on. Okay? So take a couple of minutes, I am going to reset uh, after some time 
and then when you are ready, I will call upon institutes. You don't have to raise your hands, I am going to call upon institutes today. So basically first sentence is then introductory sentence. Is just only the first sentence or more than that? Sir, more than that, first two or three lines. Okay. Now, which is the audience that can understand the first sentence? Sir, it is a broader audience. Uh, tell me, I mean, uh, what background is required to understand the first sentence? So, from a uh, electrical and electronics background. Uh, why uh, can a chemistry student not understand this? Okay. Understand that broadly. Resistance, capacitance. Anybody who has gone to school will understand that. Correct? Resistance, capacitance are small experiments done even in school. So, any high school student can understand the first sentence. So, what I wanted to point out is that the, the introductory sentence that is written is very broad. Okay? So, that is the first point I wanted to bring out. Thank you very much. Hello, Xavier. The first three sentences are introduction, sir. First three sentences are introduction. What is the background then? Which is from where you have a more background statement? A second sentence. So, the second sentence, uh, however, in 1971, uh, Leon Chua reasoned from symmetry that there should be a fourth fundamental element called and which he called as memorister. Now, this statement can be understood by which group of audience? Some uh, electrical engineer, right? So, memorister, he is already introducing some keywords. Now, uh, starting from a school student, now he has come to uh, engineering, electrical engineering department. School student, everybody understands what a resistance is and so on. Now, he is coming to something specific, memorister and so on. Okay, so, now more keywords are being introduced, correct? So, you notice this, how from broad, it is being narrowed down. It is still not very narrow. Okay? Thank you, Xavier's National College, Thirnal Valley. So, my question, I hope my question was clear. The sentence beginning, although he showed that such an element exists, has many interesting properties, until now no one has presented a useful physical model. What does this sentence represent? Can First hear. point is the general introduction, which can be understood by all, which start with anyone. And the problem is, here uh, we show, Starts. That's the third point, which indicates a problem. Okay. How how do you say that here we show is a problem? So the third point shows the problem. My question is the statement beginning. Although he showed that. Okay. What sentence does that represent? He showed that such an element has many interesting. Uh, this uh, introduction can be understood by the department. It can be understood only by the department. Thank you for your answer, but that is not correct. I am going to, uh, let me just discuss this once for you. Now, uh, everybody, take a look at this. Although he showed that there are interesting properties, until now, nobody has presented a useful physical model. Okay. This is the problem. The problem is there is no physical model. So, this is not an introduction, this is the precise problem statement. So, this is a research question. Is there a, can we get a physical model for memorister? The background is, there has been people have shown that there is something called a memorister, but there is no physical model. So, the research question that this group has taken is, can we get a physical model or a mathematical model of a memorister. So, this statement, until now no one has presented either a physical or an example of a memorister. So, this is the actual research question. Although it is not written like a question, but this is the research question. The question is, can we get a physical model? Why? Because nobody has got it before. Okay? So, this statement is the problem. It is followed by the result. One question of problem, 
one statement of result. Can we get it? Yes, we can get it and here we show blah, 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 right. The research question was can we get a physical model, all right. Answer is yes, we can get and what is it? Yes, we can get and we are here we show using a simple analytical model example, the memristor arises naturally in nanoscale systems blah, 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 whatever. Th those are all technical details, okay. You do not need to, this is just basic English. You do not need to understand it physically to understand what it is and you, you should be able to tell your students to identify this. So, in IIT Bombay, the way we do is we ask students to pick up topics from their research area and give them a article published in Nature or PNAS or top journals. Why we choose top journals? The reason is they are written by experts, experts who have written many papers and it is also reviewed by a very professional editorial body, right. So, when such things are expressed and we try to model on them, we try our, uh, we ask our students to write the abstracts modeled on them, then it is nearly close to perfect of what is expected of a abstract, okay. So, as I said, you do not need to understand the technicalities. When you show these examples to your students, uh, you do not need to have a background in this, but you should be able to just identify what are different aspects. The first aspect we have said is this is the introduction, this is a kind of little background which the department level people can understand and then this is the problem. Notice that the problem statement is given as a disruptive statement. What is a disruptive statement? A disruptive statement is something which has However, it has not been done. This is known, but this is not known. This is there, until this it was there, but this is not there, okay. So, here what is the disruptive statement? Although it has been shown, although it is known, but this is not known, okay. So, this kind of statements are called disruptive statements. So, in an introduction when you state a problem, you always state it in terms of something that is there and then you disrupt it. No one has shown, it is not there, this is not understood, this is not available and so on. That becomes your research problem, okay. So, that is your research problem followed by the result, all right. So, research, the result is up to this place, then these results serve as the foundation for understanding a wide range of something, something, okay. This is all technical, but you understand this much alone, you do not have to go beyond this. This much anybody can understand. These results serve as a foundation for understanding. So, this is what an implication of the result. Something was not known so far, I have found it, so what? You answer a question, so what? I have found this result. So what? The answer to that question is because is that this result has served as a foundation to understanding something else. Although the remaining thing is technical, I do not understand, many of you may not understand, that is okay. But when you are teaching your students, you need to just point out these cues. What you fill in there is subject specific. But these are very generic portions of the abstract that you can identify, all right. So, then this is looks like this is an implication that can be understood by people in the department. Then it is followed by the final line, okay. In, in this case, there is only one line, they do not have a broader introduction. So, there is this itself, they say it as uh, nano scale device, electronic devices, and uh, something. So, they do not have a broader statement which is okay, all right. So, now I will open uh, the uh, room for uh, questions, okay. I am going to take a couple of questions. Siliguri Institute. 
since you have told that we have to go for introduction background problem result conceptual implications broader implications but uh, we have the uh, in a system when we teach abstract writing at that moment we teach that uh, the uh, if uh, the paragraph is of 300 words we have to go for like selecting one third of it and we then simply go for introduction and the problem and then the conclusion is it the right approach or the uh, approach that you have given is the right one no so the uh, as i said at the beginning when you write an abstract you write according to this structure okay this is the most general structure that you can write for an abstract so if you see this structure of an abstract exactly reflects the structure of the paper the paper starts with an introduction the paper then follows with literature then the problem statement then the methodology then the results then the conclusion okay so that is the structure of the paper and the structure i have recommended here is the structure which reflects the paper structure instead of a paragraph of introduction i have one line of introductory statement and then a literature instead of doing a, a four or five paragraphs of literature survey i have summarized it as one line of background which is essentially literature if you notice this however in 1971 leon shua reasoned for from symmetry arguments that is essentially a literature survey conclusion from the literature survey kind of and then that is followed by methodology in the paper you give methodology then you said the pro problem then methodology then results so you can also include methodology in your abstract one line of methodology one line of result then conclusion now once you get this ready it might come to 400 words 500 words it's okay once you have this ready then from here you decide depending on what the journal requires now the structure that i have recommended is not necessarily the structure that you have to use for all journals but this is the most generic thing in many area specific journals you don't need to give the broad introduction and background because you are already suppose the journal name is journal of memristor in which case the first two lines are redundant you don't need to write the first two lines in journal of memristor okay but as a practice that you have to ask your students because when a student writes an abstract they usually write for a report or a thesis so when they write an abstract they're supposed to write as wide as possible to the uh, uh, university's audience so there they should follow this structure and once they have written this from here they can keep reducing depending on the requirement of the journal or the place you are submitting the abstract to okay does that answer your question thank you very much one more question sir yeah go ahead so i have seen uh, is it necessary to go for keywords also uh, you mean explicitly write a list of keywords or use keywords inside the introduction uh, abstract uh, inside the abstract or list of abstracts sir both yeah so uh, this question was asked before i um, i repeat the answer yes you have to use abstract keywords in within the abstract the reason being that because it's being indexed people uh, search engines use words from the abstract and because it's freely available it is easy to locate and the very important thing about keywords is that you use the same keywords everywhere you use it in the abstract if possible little bit in the title then in the introduction then in the conclusion and so on and if the keywords there are synonyms please don't use synonyms okay suppose uh, you want to tell something as called as a stress so use only stress don't use stress one place pressure one place something force per unit area another place and so on it's very important that the keywords are used the same in all the places it is one of the things that unites the article so keywords has to come everywhere and that's what links up the whole article so you need to make sure the keywords are the same okay thank you very much siliguri sona college of technology yeah my question is that sir when we when we write the abstract 
uh, when we focus on our implication or broad, broader implication is it necessary that we have to compare our results with the previous work done by others in the numerical value uh, let me repeat the question for the benefit of others the question is when we write the implication or broader implication do we need to compare our results in numerical value with the existing results and this is very uh, uh, discipline or paper specific there are two levels of implication one is an implication to your area of work and one is a very broad implication now for very broad implication definitely you don't need to compare with the previous thing now suppose it is significant that the number that you got is different from the earlier work and that is very important that is a important thing that you need to say but what does it imply that you have got a better number is a kind of a part of the result okay so you need to tell in words somebody got 5 i got 10 so what okay always keep this in mind so what if ask present it to your colleague or when your colleague presents it to you the, your colleague says that i have found this result ask them so what okay the answer to so what is what you have to write for implication you ask the question again so what till it becomes very simple okay now let's take this example so this persons have found out memristor okay they are saying that i have found out some analytical model memristor it is some electronic device let us forget about what it means he is saying i found out memristor so what uh, it is because if you get this you can do better uh, electronics so what okay so you ask this question so the answer to that so if you do better electronics maybe your health will healthcare will improve so what so then you keep on asking this till you become uh, very you uh, make a statement that is very broadly easily understood it means that it can uh, i can buy uh, better devices which will improve your lo longevity after that nobody is going to ask so what okay so you have come to us uh, this one that okay this is got very broad implications very good i understood okay so the stating number is actually part of the result answer the question so what if you have got better numbers that is part of implication Sir, I have another question to you. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, sir, when we write the abstract, is it mandatory that we need to have this much number of keywords? Or it, de it depends on the title or the perspective that we are looking for? But there is nothing mandatory about any number of keywords that you want to write. It is what you want to stress, right? And you have a limitation in number of words. So you write, so abstract and all cannot be written at one go you always have to write abstract at least twice one before beginning to write the paper so write an abstract even before writing the paper or a thesis or an article that will give you an overall perspective for how to plan to write the paper so write the abstract first and in that abstract you use whatever keywords that comes to you at that time forget about that now when you finish the paper or the thesis when the student finishes the uh, paper, uh, report or thesis and then ask them to write the abstract again maybe one time two times at that time you see if you, the, they have captured all the important keywords that is coming in the paper or the report and then you can decide to drop something or include something else so abstract is at least written twice one before and one after the final structure has come okay again we'll take one last question from gharda institute of technology uh, sir actually uh, somewhat i got the answer my question is what is the ideal method of writing abstract is it first we should write abstract and then paper or first we should write paper and then abstract so I answered a question and you are asking a question for that. Okay, I will repeat it. So you write abstract at least twice. 
you write it before starting writing the paper or a report because that will give you, it is called a guiding abstract. The first abstract that you write is called as a guiding abstract which helps you write the paper. So, first abstract is for yourself, it is to guide you to structure the, your thoughts to structure the paper. And then once you have written the complete paper and you have revised it and as a final form, you are right to write another abstract, revise the abstract. Now, the intended audience is the actual readers. Initially, the audience was you. You wanted to something to guide you to write the abstracts. You write that first so that guide you to write the paper. After that, you write a final abstract which is polished and written well and it actually matches the structure of the paper intended for the actual readers. Okay. All right. So, what we will do now is I will go back and we will take a second example and I would ask you to do the same exercise. Now, the first exercise I almost guided you. Now, this one I am not going to guide you. I want each of you to write down in your own uh, paper which is the introductory statement. Take the sentence rechargeable solid state and tell me write it down in your paper the uh, write the first two words rechargeable solid state it corresponds to introduction something else corresponds to background something else corresponds to problem and so on. So, write the first two words write it down in a piece of uh, paper or your notebook and then discuss it with your neighbor. All right, I think we are uh, uh, close to this one. We will continue this uh, activity uh, after we are back from lunch. So, uh, spend the next couple of minutes uh, looking at each of these lines and identify, for example, you should write rechargeable solid state batteries is colon introduction and so on. So, do that and we will come back from lunch at 1:15 and i will we will discuss point wise